Bees, and welcome to a very special Scuzz special. Lots and lots of specials there in the intro. Feeling very special. With, with uh, Mr. Jason Newstead. How you doing, man? Good, thank you. So we open this show um, the same way every single time, which is who were the first musicians that made you want to pick up a bass guitar? And going off of what we were saying before we started rolling, no pressure, but mine was you. Nice. So, <laughs> what big deal. No, yeah, no pressure. I appreciate that. But um, I think in my childhood, I have two older brothers, one five and one eight years older. Their record collect collections were kind of diverse. They had some rock and some heavy stuff, and that was the 70s, right? So they had Black Sabbath albums, things like that. But mostly in our household, funk music played. Right. And rhythm and blues music played. And uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Ohio Players, and uh, even some more obscure bands, The Sun, and LTD, and some of these other funk bands. And we lived in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It was about halfway in between Detroit and Chicago on the main freeway of I-94. And so when I was a kid, I could go into Woolworths and find these records for 19, and, 19 cents and 29 cents for 45s with like garage funk and different things. So without me even knowing it, things, music, songs that were bass dominated were always in my house. And that's where I got bit early without knowing it. And Jackson 5 and all that kind of thing, just worshipped every line, everything. And now I go back and listen to James Jamerson bass, and I hear why I liked it so much, because of how good the bass was. There was something there for me. Um, once it came around and I got a bass when I was 13 or 14 years old, I mostly just focused on the records that my brothers had in their collections. And I would try to learn a few pieces here and there, putting the record, you know, and then a needle back on the vinyl and trying to learn some songs. And sometimes those were, you know, Jeff Beck albums or Doobie Brothers records or things like that that still had really pretty sick bass lines. It was Stanley Clark and some other dudes that played some pretty wicked bass. And I just tried to figure out a little bit at a time. Then uh, in junior high, a kid brought a Kiss record. And I saw these guys and, you know, was obviously motivated like most of us at that time by the cartoon character imagery and yeah. larger than life kind of vibe. Very attractive. So Gene Simmons influenced me to be more like of a showman bass guy and want to really take it a little more seriously. And then Getty Lee from Rush and uh, Rob Grange from the Ted Nugent Band, things like that. Ba bands that were popular in the Midwest and especially in Ohio and Michigan and Canada and stuff, so that would have been Nugent and Rush and Alice Cooper and things like that. So where Flotsam and Jetsam is the first thing that we associate you with, mm. that must that must have given you a, an extra edge as a bassist, like having grown up on all that sort of funk stuff, it's not what you'd associate with guys that had come from, that were part of the thrash scene yeah. at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the bass thing, so I always started on bass. I mean, I got a guitar when I was nine years old and I first yeah. did guitar and stuff, but I, the, um, probably about a year and a half later, it, it was the three keys on a side student guitar like that. I took the middle two keys off the top so it would have <laughs> four keys and then two strings down the he edge of the neck and two down the middle. <laughs> you know, but I wanted it to be a bass, uh, even back then on acoustic So body, you stole so out early. Kind of, yeah. That was kind of thing. I still have that instrument. Um, so anyway, that's that's the that was the deal. I always was attracted to that bass thing. And once Gene Simmons came and that just started taking place, I think that helped me through when we got into Flotsam and played those different things. There's always been a bit of a bounce, a bit of a jump to the music I've been involved in writing, mm. even in the Metallica stuff and Black and stuff like that. There's still funk to it. Ba -da 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 yeah. You know, there's still funk to it, and it's and a lot of the Newstead music, a lot of funk, I think, too, a lot of groove. It's metal with a heavy groove, you know. And um, I, I, I suppose to, to talk about the you entering Metallica, a lot is said about that period of time and the sad circumstances, but not a lot is really known about the actual rehearsal you had with those guys. Interesting. How, how would you describe the vibe in the room at that time? Because, you know, when we've seen the, the bits of behind the music and mm, things like that, where, yeah, like... It yeah, it's edited. Yeah. Like, how, how would you describe the the vibe in the room when you walked in, like, Jason from Flotsam and Jetsam yeah. walks in with his bass? You know, um, because of the f playing field that we found ourselves on, um, that uh, an incredible, um, very special person, Jimi Hendrix of bass, in my opinion, uh, was taken. And so, way, 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 way too early, and his fate brought about my destiny. And that's a really, it's tough ground to stand on. And uh, it was very surreal to begin with because Metallica is my favorite band and I get a chance to go play with them. And so already I'm just, I'm levitating, my head's spinning. It's just a crazy thing. In the room itself, in the building itself was very tense and somber and a bit sad and those kind of things. And everybody was considerably inebriated. 
Um, you know, like yeah, well oiled. Yeah, I think that you know I auditioned maybe 27 or 28 days after after Cliff actually was killed, mm -hmm. probably two weeks after they spread his ashes up north in California. You know that I was actually in the room playing out of his amp. You know. Um, so it was a weird vibe, and they they went to bed drinking, waking up drinking. You know, it's just the way it was. They had they were trying to grieve and not knowing how to do a 23 and 24 year old men yeah. that had no idea or like really any kind of serious family structure within any of those persons' lives in order to build that kind of capacity where you could know what to do when it was time to grieve about something serious like this. Nobody had that. Nobody would have known about that or was taught that. It was that. someone it was just, from yeah, their gang. It was, was, was their teacher. You know, their, Cliff was the one everybody else looked up to in that band. Every mm. band has a person that they look up to. Yeah. Or the leader or the thing like that, the gifted one. He was the gifted one. Even amongst people like Hammett and Hetfield, he was still the gifted one. Yeah, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's pretty heavy. And so he taught them a lot of things through time. And so to have that teacher and that great admired one taken away like that was pretty heavy. They didn't care about anybody else. They, I could have been made of freaking plutonium and walked in there and they said it wouldn't have mattered. Right. You know, it just didn't matter. They didn't want anybody standing over there other than their boy. Yeah. And so, and the powers that be and the things that were going on, they're trying to keep the momentum going and the machine going and making up for Ozzy shows and all the things that had to be, that were committed to, that had to be achieved or had to be resolved. They wanted to keep going. So you had to imagine how their heads were spinning crazy, grieving, ugly and trying to accept somebody for a second. And see if I'm even making a judgment of somebody that could play worth the or not. Yeah. And some cats came in there that could play, you know. But I got there first on the day that I, the first day, uh, day I auditioned, I got there first early in the morning before they got there, probably like nine in the morning. And I waited all day. Lars wanted to have me play last. That was already his intention because he knew that I had, you know, because of the things that we talked about, tape mm. trading and correspondence throughout the world, when he reached out, see what was going on, my name come up with a lot of people. So he wanted to have me go last. So I waited and watched all the guys coming through the doors and come, from, come from the airport and get out of the airport, walk on with their base, have the, you know, look through the window and watch what James' reaction was to him. I had this little cubby hole dug out within their road cases. There's like Metallica cases all around me. But, uh, you know, cats would come in and out. People heard this story before, but it's, it's really pretty crazy. I remember one guy, I don't, know, I don't know where he was from, but it's all the way from the East Coast. So he flew all the way across the United States from one side to the other to the Bay Area, water to water like that and spent the whole day on the freaking plane. Brought his, pl brought his base in, and he walks in, and because of his attire and his do and so forth, um, you know, like fringe on the boots and, and uh, three-color hair and, you know, this kind of stuff. Wow. And, 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 and Hetfield's already in, like, Strong look. eight or ten poor lights <laughs> in to the afternoon, you know. And he looks over at this guy, you know. He's like, next. Like, dude didn't even get Brutal. to plug in. Dude, he flew, flew all the way. <laughs> You know, he'd been losing sleep and trying to learn the songs, Man. and his head's all coming over. He gets there, steps in the room, doesn't even get to plug in. Brutal. Has to turn right back out the door and go back and get on the plane and fly the way all of this. Jeez. <laughs> that was a long flight home. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So there was a few of those things like that. And um, and there was a couple cats that I thought did really good that didn't get called back. I was kind of surprised. I was fine with it, of course. <laughs> yeah. Surprised that they didn't get called back. Um, so Troy Gregory and Les, I think, and myself, and, and uh, one other guy, Willie Lang from Las Rocket, got called back. Halloween of 86, October 31, 86, I played the last show with Flotsam and Jetson. And loaded my SVT and my rig and all my stuff into my old Ford truck and drove back to the Flotsam house where we all lived together and loaded the stuff back in there. Everybody knew I had already joined Metallica at that time. I'd been asked to play with Metallica, not joined yet. Right. Been asked, asked to play with Metallica. And we're all wearing black armbands for Cliff that night. And, um, you know, yeah, lo load my gear in and out of the thing. Nine or ten days later, sold out Budokan with yeah. Metallica. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I went from this to holy <laughs> in about fast. Uh, so you get, so you got the call and you, you, were, you were asked to play with Metallica, right? right? It's, it's well documented that they gave you a hell of a lot of in those early, in those early bits, deservedly was so. There, was there anything um, that alluded to that might be the case? As uh, now the dust has settled, and I've been able to look back at everything. It took me like ten years to come down, actually. So I just came down a little while ago and got this thing together. But I just look back on all these things. We mm. talk about, I mean, a tons of things, the things that we're going to touch on. Yeah. And things that, as I look back on the, on the hindsight thing. Any 
super hyper exclusive club in the universe, okay, uh -huh. has a bit of a hazing and testing process to know if the person that they've asked to join them is ever going to cut it. Yeah. Okay? You have got to go through tests. When you're going to go, do you just become the CEO of a company and just go, he's got a nice suit, let's get him. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, you got to go through all of the <laughs> and everything. If you're even to get down at this part of level, let alone the CEO, Amen. you got to go through that and that and that to be in this exclusive club right here. So now we're talking about this club that ends up having to be the largest <laughs> monster of a heavy metal band that ever existed. Um, and even at that time, we all knew that was destiny. We all knew that was going to happen. They were the best at that point already. Yeah, yeah, they're messing. Right, no question about it. So as I look back on it going, I would have grilled me 10 times as much as they grilled me right. to get in this exclusive club, to let little old me in yeah. this thing that they've already achieved. They were already the way of Master of Puppets. Yeah, they were already on their freaking launch. I mean, it was, Yeah, with those three records were already, already behind you. They were mid-trajectory yeah. like this. I came in and happened to help with the trajectory keep going. Yeah, yeah. But the fact was they were already on their way. Yeah. They had to know I was going to be able to make it. So I think it was more of a testing thing. It was a mix between their uncomfortability because of not knowing how to handle the grieving thing, really missing that Cliff was there and his smarts and his insight mm. and the things that I didn't possess. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah, how could you and do so, Chris so, was a one-off? Right, so between that and just the general thing, like we got to know if he's okay or not, yeah. the mixture of those things, that's what got me the grilling. Now, I really have to be, and I want everybody to realize very importantly that things like this across the press, across the world, across any kind of entertainment business, any, mm. any part of it, little things like this, it, one thing gets a rumor and one thing gets that and it gets talked about. It's yeah. Things that can be sensationalized, yeah, yeah. whether they're bloody or funny or goofy or can make fun of it or whatever yeah, like yeah. that, those are the things that people jabber about and become some kind of legend or yeah, rumor yeah, totally. or whatever the heck like that. The so mint sauce wasabi one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, and that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's all, all of that happened. But it wasn't that bad yeah, yeah, yeah. considering the dividend. Yeah, I mean, like, like holy Man. But I do get to be in the greatest band that's ever lived, right? I'll eat some wasabi if I get to play <laughs> yeah. another sold yeah. out Budokan. Oh, we're at the we're yeah. at the Tokyo Dome sold yeah. out. Okay, yeah, send yeah. me the hotel bill, bro. I'm fine. Right, right. You know? Because tonight, that's about that much of what I'm making. So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, in, in perspective, yeah, yeah, yeah. it wasn't that bad. And, right. And they really, and there was way more fun and accomplishment and achievement and brotherhood. And vibes, and you know that kind of con yeah. conquering, yeah. bulletproof, invincible, yeah. Than any of the hubbub, and all of the hubbub was the first like three to six months. I got asked to join Metallica as a full member yeah, yeah, yeah. in April of 1987. Right. Okay, so I had cut the mustard for six months, making mm -hmm. up all those shows with them, going around, prove that I could do what I could do. Most importantly, on the stage, of course. Mm -hmm. And then we did the garage days. So, you know, the things worked out. They worked out. They saw that I could do it. So after I joined the band, all of that kind of hazing, you made it in the club thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. considerably, you know, tapered off. Now, through time, was I the guy that got picked on through shit? Yes, I was. You know why? Because I was the new guy. Yeah. Always going to be the new guy. The new guy's always going to get picked on. You know, in our band now, new guy gets picked on. I mean, it's, 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 it's nice not to be the new guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. new stud, but not the new guy. I like it. So, but I know I know why it was the way it was. If it would have been any other way, we wouldn't have lasted for 15 years together. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, you know, I mean, it had to happen. We obviously gelled on and off the stage in order for it to, to make it dominate like it did for so long and still does. And, like, it's in heavy metal folklore, but do you ever feel like you could have or, or should have thought a little bit for your bass to be heard a little bit more and had justice for all. I would have had no idea <laughs> who to fight, right. what was happening, be like swinging it was happening. Swinging at thin air. Um, punching in the dark at nothing. Yeah. There's... We're... It's 1988. We're on Monsters of Rock during the summer. Scorpions, Van Halen, Dokken. We're playing second on the bill and crushing every... <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Just un un undeniable. <laughs> No matter who uh, who you ask across the board, even Van Halen will go. <laughs> they kicked our. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? It's just the way yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. So that was a whirlwind in itself. That was like a big, big step that was happening, and we did it three, four shows a week as they moved that giant around the countryside. In between those days, 
Lars and James were trying to mix, finish record, make an artwork, blah, 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 get all that stuff. I was the dude over here in the band still going, the world's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Around How the, many people? And I'm like, there's one. <laughs> yeah. Bass on an album. That's yeah. great. I play, yeah, yep. I recorded my bass parts. Yep. Two days. Yeah. Two days I recorded all the bass parts. Then I went home. And then just like I would ever have done in any flotsam thing up to that point, because that's all I would have known up to that point. We did a couple of flotsam demos. Okay, that one, how long did that take? Six hours for all the way from the beginning to the ending of the mastering. Okay, how long did that, <laughs> how long did that demo take? Eight hours all the way from that to the ending of the mastering. Doomsday for the Deceiver, how long did that take? Six days from the beginning of the sounds to the end of the mastering. Okay, so you go in with the dude, and then Kelly goes and sits on his drums, and I sit over here and look through the glass on the bass, and I go, two, three, four. <laughs> okay, that one's done. Two, three, four. <laughs> and that one's done, and that's what we did. There wasn't like a producer, director, guy coming in. Wait a minute, that needs to be a little more uniform right there. That sounds a little out of tune, man. Yeah. You know, or any of the shit yeah, that yeah. I know now. Just and go. You just go. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I knew. Yeah. So we did Garage Days, five days. Do, 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 to yep. the end, five days. Okay, well, so that's how Metallica does it too, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah. listen to the Garage Days. <laughs> okay, there it is, the bass is there. It's all mixed real nice. The bass is loud as f on Garage Days. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Going, Here we go, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. that's what I knew. So go in with the assistant engineer to do the justice thing. Set up the same rig I recorded Doomsday with and Garage Days with. I sit down, dude puts it on, I go yeah. and play the freaking song. Come yeah, back yeah. the next day, the other five songs, done. Drive, my, load my back in my truck myself, drive back Still home. Still DIY. Knowing that it's gonna come out sounding like Garage Days going do 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 yeah. do 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 Yeah. Well, it didn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. My boys were busy, they were considerably drunk. <laughs> Lars like <laughs> then. And a lot of things like that. Besides the engineer guys being, I mean, they like their, I mean, we don't want to even go to those places. Yeah, wherever, yeah, their, yeah. wherever their preferences were, that's what they were able to distract them yeah. from making the meat and potatoes of that thing. Right. Any record we listen to, doesn't matter if it's Red Fang or whoever. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Through time. I know what's coming in. Okay. Gee, who mixed that record? The guitar player! <laughs> okay, who yeah. mixed that record? Well, considering that the hi-hat is louder than the lead vocal, I'm gonna say the drummer. Yeah, no, well, there's no denying it. That's kind of what happened. Yeah, when that snare comes in and blackened, even now, yeah, like... And, they, and who, who mixed this record? Sounds like there's only two people in the band there. Oh, what two people mixed the record? Oh, the two guys you can hear? Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Totally. We were, Kirk and I were nowhere in sight when it came to mixes. Right, we okay. were in the hotel waiting after the Monsters of Rock gig for the next Monsters of Rock gig. James and Lars flew from the Monsters of Rock gig to Bearsville to keep going back and forth to New York with these guys and mixing those. are in between those gigs. Wow, brutal schedule. So completely spun out. Yeah, and yeah. All, and and yeah. all that anyway, <laughs> yeah, in addition yeah. to yeah. being spun out. Full-blown show every day with all the, I mean, we did LA Coliseum and 80-some thousand people. During three at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, under the bright LA sun, and, and there was no empty seats. That that doesn't happen. So we're talking we're talking on eighty thousand people and all these big things that had happened. So were people within the band, and was yourself ready for the level of crazy that it reached post Black Album? Mm, yes, I think we were. Yeah. Um, they Metallica had enough hours and years on the road and, and honing it and everything they're ready inclu including the crew uh, it's very important you know there's four faces and bodies and voices and whatever that represent Metallica but there are thousands of people that make Metallica go mm -hmm. and so the having the same crew members for years and years and years to make everything just as it's presented is as important as a guitar player warming up for his solos you know what I mean? That's yeah, a big, big deal to have well, the same yeah. people and knowing what the hell's going on in order yeah. for us to present our show the way that people want to come back to see the show again and again. Mm -hmm. It takes more than just the four guys. So once that was established and in place, along with our conviction, you know, and that kind of thing, we got together on the Black Album, learned a lot from Bob Rock, learned how to present stuff. I learned how to play bass, you know, like lay down some bass, not just play bass like guitar. Yeah. You know, thoughts and I wrote the songs on the bass and the dudes on the guitar followed the bass and then that became the song. Mm -hmm. I realize, you know, man, here's the part of the it's orchestra that's dee 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 dee. You don't go, but little way, just yeah. dee dee dee. So that started coming into play, and the thickness is sad but true, you know. All the 
dimensions of the orchestra were starting to be in place. So I think that we were ready for it as it was ready for us. If you look at the some of the footage, you know, like the for those about to rock, the Moscow footage or mm. Day on the Green footage from those years, um, we were firing on all cylinders. That possibly the peak of that band period. I think uh, like picking up on little things on a year and a half in the life of Metallica. Um, there's a particularly poignant moment I found when it came to yourself, where you were talking about um, you were making sandwiches for yourself. Uh, you had plans for the future and it didn't involve busting money at left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. And like seeing the difference between that and he's, my, he's one of my all-time heroes, so I'm not knocking the man, but seeing Lars in a white leather jacket with tassels, like how was it like to be the guy at the opposite end of that particular spectrum at that point in time? I mean, I was always comfortable with myself. I know who I am and everything, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So that, like, you know, I come from a good strong family and this kind of stuff. So I think I had my feet on the ground in certain capacity for certain things, you know, that those guys didn't have because of my family. Mm. Um, and that was that's a really important thing. I mentioned it before too. Yeah, it yeah. really is an important thing as you go through everything that you go through because you have a new family out on the road. You know, from my entire adult life, 23 to 38 years old, up you know to that point, my family was Metallica and mm -hmm. all the crew people of Metallica and stuff. So. Um, being on the other side of that, the rock star thing, I was I was his uh, counter anchor, you know, and I think we probably were each other's through time. Yeah. We actually are closer now than, I mean, we're actually really good bros, and he, he's taught me a lot, and I taught him a lot, and I think, you yeah. know, without him knowing it. Yeah. I don't know if he, he, <laughs> he wouldn't admit it, he wouldn't have admitted it to you back then, but he will admit it to you now. Yeah, I think yeah. that we've all matured a little bit or whatever, growing up a little bit or something like that. Um, but it was strange to see that because it was important to me to really keep it keep it real. I mean, people use that phrase so so simply, but yeah. that's it. Really, is it's important. Evident. It's important when you're being pulled in 50 directions at the same time. Head is all swelling up because you're just a human being. Yeah. And every freaking minute, people are doing this right here. Uh -huh. You know, and you're trying to keep your feet on the ground. I'm still just this dude. I'm still just this kid from Michigan that got lucky, practiced my bass really hard, and got in a good band. And you still felt like that I on the back like that right now. Awesome. Still yeah, feel yeah. like that right now. I'm still appreciative every day. I'm grateful to be doing what I'm doing all the time. I'll never forget that. I'll never talk an ill word about Metallica. You know, that's there. I'm. I'm always going to be a part of Metallica. Nobody can ever take that away from me. Yeah, totally. You know, I ended up being like the most decorated heavy metal bass player in history because of my opportunity that they gave me. So I'm not ever going to let that no, go. No, no. You know what I'm saying? But it was important for me to maintain my normal. C or whatever it would be yeah, perceived yeah. as because of the ways that Lars really wanted to be a rock star. He's built to yeah, be one. He's God. good at it. That's his thing in peace. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't ever against him for any of those things. No, no, but no. Did I want to be in all the pictures with the white leather jacket? No. The answer <laughs> yeah, yeah, is yeah. no. I did you not want to be. You one yourself? No, I didn't. <laughs> but I would. I already did that a long time ago. I have white leather pants. They were wow. flats in one photo session. One photo session, you know, so I know it's how to It's my Google image search right. as soon as we finish. Yes. <laughs> I knew what that was about, but it, at that day, at that day and age, at that time, yeah. going through, I was really trying to keep the freaking grit in the band, you mm. know, as much as I could. So it was kind of strange. I did, I did, the, did the band kind of as a whole cut that out quite a bit post Guns N' Roses tour? Because it's like you know, oh. there's, a, there's a white, there's like a there's a oh, there's a white leather yeah. jacket here, yeah, yeah. but like these, if these guys, these guys are like, if they the white leather jackets here, they're like three counties that way. <laughs> did, did it did it kind of did it kind of make everyone go, wow, well, you know, we're we're still is, we're still like yeah. we're still these guys, and it's it's well, important to not I run think. away. <laughs> <laughs> run away, Montreal, basically. I yeah, I think yeah. That, I think that. Uh, Lars got caught up in that thing with the guns guys. He really had, was having fun with that and being yeah. a rock star thing. And he dug, you know, wanted to do that for a second. He tasted. He saw that it wasn't really right for us necessarily. All of us would have went off on our own little yeah. things to, and then got back again and grounded and things. So we had to reel him back in. It was all good. But I do want to say something about the cat because there's two comments that people come to me and talk about, pretty much a weekly basis. I would say for 20 years, and the one is about an eight. For Sandwiches. Yep. Right. I got plans for those millions. Yep. And sandwiches. sandwiches. So people come and talk to me about that all the time. And the other one is about you guys. So I think you guys sold out. So yeah, sold out every seat in the house every night. So that's like they, people love that and they always come up and remind me. But the thing, if you go back and actually look at that when I'm talking about that, like go talk to Jason. He's making sandwiches over there because yeah. he's too cheap to get room service. Right. And I'm like, okay, well I got plans for these millions, and I'm gonna buy myself a country, maybe in Idaho, and stuff like that. Well. 
I have a ranch. <laughs> True to your word. On the border of Idaho and Montana. It's one square mile. Wow. Wow, that's the size of the town I grew up in. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. Say no more, yeah. Nudge yeah. It's like, what the? Come on. <laughs> Man, I, I, to I told you! Yeah, yeah, yeah he did. <laughs> Stick around for more from Scars Beach, Jason Newstead. So, I have to say, I think the most underappreciated rock record of the last 25 years is the Load record. Mm. Uh, I will fight people to the death. Well, people out there already know it because I've banged They'll on be about bruised. it. Long They'll enough. be bruised pretty yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? How was it for you, creatively, of that at that time? Because we were talking before we were we were rolling about. Um, I used to read your uh, musical selections in So What magazine, mm -hmm. and like it felt very much um, as a as a wide-eyed thirteen-year-old when that record came out. That like you were the guy that was that was representing for Sepultura and Corn and mm -hmm. all those bands at that point in time. Um, Whereas the Load records went off in different tangents for what Metallica had done at that point in time and, and was decidedly less what the stereotypical Metallica fan wanted. Mm. Um, how was that for you while those songs were coming together? It was kind of a disjointed time. Um, a lot of those songs we didn't actually get to rehearse together as a band. You know, we played some of them here and some of them here, and some of them piece some of them together here and piece some of them together here like that. But there was so much music, like 30 songs or something to try uh -huh. to make sense of, or heads or tails, or what would go with the other one and what didn't work there, and trying to focus on one song at a time and forgetting about all the others, that's quite a task. Mm. You know, trying to just make that one what it is, but then when Sounds that like one's done, it has, yeah, it, has, it has pieces of these ones over here because you weren't paying enough attention that these ones were existing too in the album that you want to present. So that, that kind of thing was a little confusing. Um, within those songs, you know, at that time, I, I feel on those records especially, I don't know if it was just because I was keeping a distance, my own self-made thing, or that those guys were being more protective of the songs. But James and Lars seemed to be very closed in on those ones. Okay. Um, and we eventually got to come in and do some pieces on those, you know, on those songs, but it was still, it seemed like a little more protected for some reason, I don't know why by mm. them, that's what I remember. But you know, we went back and we made some of the music in Los Angeles, some in San Francisco, and some in New York, lived in New York City for a while to make that record. That was kind of weird in general too for San Francisco Bay Area good. guys to be there. There's so many distractions going on in that in a place like that that you can't really focus on the music. Mm. I would always vote for going to a place like where we made the Echo Brain record up in Northern California. It's a self-contained studio. You go and you lock it down for a month or a month and a half. They're there's a it. shelf, and there's a, she a shelf. <laughs> there's a chef that yeah. cooks and all those kind of things in quarters, and you stay there. And there's no stores or anything or any kind of civilization. It's just in the mountains, really. You're just there to make the music. And I prefer to do that thing. When there's more distractions, then, of course, it takes longer to make the record, and it isn't quite mm. as focused and doesn't have the teeth that it probably should have. Mm. So I think that a lot of that took place. And there was a lot of personal challenges within that time for the members of the band, like doing their own things. First marriages and second marriages and children, right, and yeah, all those yeah. things like that. So a lot of that played a part in how those records were made um, as far as the focus and the get down, nose to the stone thing. That's mm. what I remember. And uh, do you have favorite tracks from those particular records? You know, I can't remember a lot of titles. I cannot uh -huh. remember the titles <laughs> um, of these songs. I couldn't you know, say the low record goes, here's the sequence, bam, 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 bam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bam, bam. I, there's no way I could do that. I, yeah. can, I really couldn't tell you which one 2x4 was on, and I couldn't yeah, tell yeah. you which one Fuel was on. I don't know. Load, reload. Okay. Gotcha. So, I, yeah, so I, I just don't, I really didn't yeah. pay attention to it in that way. When you get that close to it, listen to retakes and remixes and bass up and bass down and voice up and blah, 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 all these different <laughs> yeah, things. Yeah. After a while, I don't think I ever really sat and listened to those albums in their entirety as a fan or anything right. like I have with the other records. Okay. So I guess we'll... Fast forward a couple of years, I can't imagine the the moment where you, you decided, uh, I can't do this anymore. Do you remember the specific, the moment where, where I mean, presumably I, I got that, I, th I think it's a misnomer, the echo brain thing, that people seem to think that it's because of echo brain like you left to do Echo Brain, where it was like it was more like there'd been all of these times on the run up to it where you'd been like, well, actually, I want to do that and I want to do that, and I'd quite like to produce these guys, and like it was like it was like the sum of all parts. Mm -hmm. But like I can't imagine. 
after going through all that and that being a frustration, do you remember the moment where you went, I just, I can't do this anymore, enough? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I've never, I've, I've never told the story. I'm not sure if I should tell it now, actually. Um, I mean, talk about what you're comfortable about. Now. There was, there was, a, there was a lot leading up to it, you know, through time. No, the Echo Brain thing was another. It was uh, started out as a project with these kids that were very, very promising, just like a million other projects that I've done. Could have been, I mean, you know, I played with the Voivod guys for how many, eleven or twelve years before I even started the Echo Brain project. You know, 14 years before I made any records with Voivod, I was playing with Voivod. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm always jamming with people and doing my thing. Echo Brain was just another project at that particular time. But I wanted to get more serious about it because I felt that it deserved it. The very upside down thing, I don't, I just, I don't think that anybody knows. Um, the management of Metallica was very, very excited about Echo Brain. Like, wanted to take it out for me. What? Okay, wanted me to do Echo Brain also with Metallica. They felt Echo Brain was that good, the singer was that good. And it didn't affect Metallica because it was a totally different kind of thing. And I was in Metallica, that would give it its pedigree already. And so they had told me, you know, pretty convincingly, this is a great record. We've been playing it around the office. That's all I've been hearing. It's fantastic. This kid has a great voice. Let's do something with this. Okay, that's what they told me. And then James heard about it and was not happy. And he was, I think, pretty much out to put the kibosh on the whole thing because it would somehow affect Metallica in his eyes because now the managers yeah, were interested yeah, yeah. in something I was doing that had nothing to do with him. I was writing my own songs and doing my own thing. I'm not sure inside him. Hmm. I don't know why or what or anything. I'm not going to say anything bad. Yeah. So I have no idea what he was thinking other than just protecting what he valued, just like he does. That's his thing. He protects his, He protects yeah, yeah. What, he, what he loves. Squeezes it too hard, like he said it himself. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Squeeze it too hard. You know, protecting it too much, but... That's, the, that's where I was coming from. The people that I had counted on for 15 years to help me with my career, help Metallica, take care of my money, do all of those things, told me, your new project is fantastic, we'd like to help you with it. James heard about it, manager calls him back a couple of days later, sorry, we're not gonna be able to help you with that echo brain thing. Okay, so I'm like, okay, hmm. So I put all this money in it, worked really hard, went up in the mountains, made the record. Fantastic record. A diamond, Kirk Hammett called it. A diamond. Wow. Yeah. I mean, his wife played it in their car, and he'd get sick of it. I remember that. <laughs> Actually, Lars's girlfriend, Lars's next to last girlfriend, mm. really liked Echo Brain a lot. Would play it in his car too and make him crazy. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of happened. But um, between those two things, I was very confused. You know, I had been dedicated to Metallica, and everything came first. I mean, every, everything came after. What I'm saying, the band came first, and everything came after Metallica. I sacrificed many, many things. Like rewards were great. Don't get me wrong; I'm not complaining. No, no, of course. I'm just it's saying not I made, made, that made great sacrifices to be the guy that I wanted to be in that band. First one in, last one out. Play every show like I'm never going to get to play again. All of that type of thing. I really try to do that. So when he did that to me after all those years and all the things we'd been through and help each other reach our own goals and our collective goals. Um, it hurt, and I was like, man, really, dude, you don't view me as this equal person to you, like uh, how much I respect you. You just respect me that much? That's a really hard thing for me to, does not compute, computer yeah. says no. Yeah, totally, right? totally. Okay, so just <laughs> not, not working. Yeah. And, um, so we went to do uh, making of, the Black Album yeah, yeah. for that classic album. Yeah, 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 I've seen that, yeah. It was on uh, September 27th. You know what day that is? Mm -hmm. The Day of Cliff. So on September 27th in uh, 2000, we went to L.A. together to the place that we made the Black Album to talk about the Black Album. And I had uh, copies of the Echo Brain thing I was passing around. Bob Rock is there, Andy Staub's there, and the guy's, let me have one, let me have one. Oh, dude, that's great. Oh, I heard some of it. It's really fantastic. And James is in the room. Not liking it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we went about our business, and we did our first thing. They, we set up for this thing. Go, you guys are going to play that song. We're going to film that. Okay, we go and play. 
Now we're going to do that, and James Lowry's going to talk over there, and they're going to film that, take a break. As they go around, you know the TV, you know the TV. Yeah. So, uh, he pulls me aside, and he says, what's, what's your plan with this music? What do you plan on doing? And I said, we've got to get a record together. I plan on taking it out to people and do a few shows that, as long as it doesn't uh, get in the way of Metallica stuff. So you plan on telling, selling T-shirts and everything? I'm like, yeah, probably. Well, I'm not sure I'm good with this. He went on to say, I'm not sure exactly what they were just saying because my head started spinning and whirling and really <laughs> feeling like a little kid being reprimanded after all the things we went through. And he's younger than me. Hmm. And uh, that in itself is just kind of, you know yeah. what I mean? He said, other arrangements can be made. He looks me in the eye. That's the answer to your question. I've never told the world yeah. that before, ever. Yeah. So we better be very careful with this. No. Nope. But the, uh, that's the deal. Other arrangements can be made. That was the moment. On a cliff's day. Mm. Okay? Wow. Both bass players left the same day. That's a... Yeah, that's a head... That's a head f***ing uh -huh. Same day we both left. Um, as, as an outsider, uh, it felt very... Um, once the echo brain thing had had kind of been and gone, you went and done the Aussie thing. That felt very out of the frying pan into the fire from, a, from an outsider's perspective. Yeah, was it, it was it weird being part of a, the Aussie organisation? Well, in between that time of uh, January of 2001, mm. when I called the meeting to tell the band I was leaving, I had, everybody already knew. I had already let Kirk know, actually, the night that we just spoke of, September 27th. Right. I told him that night oh. as we're, we went to the airport together to fly back home. Had a beer and I told him I was going to leave. Did he believe? He's, Did he believe uh, you? You better think about that for a while. You really better think about yeah, that. Yeah, I could imagine. Said, like, yeah. yeah. And then I had Lars over about a week later, maybe two weeks later, he came to the chop house, which was not a frequent thing. And uh, talk, I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go. I said, I can't, I'm not, I can't deal with the, the way that things are happening and I'm not appreciated and uh, all this kind of thing. So Did I'm, they so really I'm gonna believe go. that you were going to walk out? And actually, Lars said to me, I'll beat you out the door. And I said, probably not. And, uh, so that wow. they, they knew it was coming for yeah. three, three months. I told the other guys, Kirk, four months, Lars, three months, knew that it was going to happen. So that they would have some kind of warning about whatever plans they needed to make or whatever like that. And, mm -hmm. and I was actually hoping that they would think about it for a minute yeah. and get together Is it worth it? a side of, from me and say, let's go talk to our boy. Yeah. He might be a little ill, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I called the meeting. I was going. Well, I wasn't going to screw up anybody's Christmas. That was my whole thing. I was I, seriously. <laughs> no, no, no. I just. No, I, no, it's not, just I, I think not. it speaks volumes that that was what you were thinking. My dad told me that any kind of major decision, you're going to buy a house or do any kind of thing like this or get married and stuff. Three months. Give it three months to really drill it, man. Really go over every possible thing, and then you can make a decision. If you're dropping hundreds of thousands for a house, you're doing this or that. You, you know, make Ooh. sure you know you're doing the right thing. So I thought about it for three months and thought about it and it went on and on and on. I just had, it was, it was what was going to take place. I had a lot of confidence in, in Echo Brain and I was feeling really sour about the Metallica thing and that. So January 8th, um, called him, actually it was the 10th, called a meeting at Four Seasons and uh, walked in the room and <clears throat> I think Kirk was there already. And the, uh, the guy that I didn't know was sitting there with glasses and a ball here and a real bright colored sweater. Excuse me, sir, who are you? I'm Phil Toll and... Um, oh, you met that guy! Let me go on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I said that I'm Phil Toll and I've been uh, asked by your managers to come here and talk to you guys. And he's got his Super Bowl ring on. And I said, uh, and I said what, what's your status? What's your, what's your title? So I'm, uh, I help uh, pro sports teams and I help uh, big organizations like this get along so they can carry on with their whatever their work is. Like, it's nice to meet you. Um, you don't know me. You don't know our band. You haven't been through what we've been through. I'm really glad that they brought you here. Get the f*** out of this room. Totally fair. Just like that. I didn't ask it nice. Because <laughs> I, 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 well, like... I was not in the mood for anything <laughs> but unleashing. Yeah. And I planned on crying for the next three weeks after it and all that <laughs> So I was on the edge of erupting and giving away my dream, basically throwing it away. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And tossing it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With this knucklehead <laughs> in the room 
that had no idea about anything, didn't even know my middle name or where I was born or what we'd been through together. He could, no way he could know what we'd been through together. No, no, no. Just like it says in the movie. Yeah. You know, like Wait. squillions of dollars yeah. for real that we had made decisions about and made the world go around and dominated to be the biggest band of all time. The four of us, the way we played, the way we worked, the way we made happen. You know, it didn't have anything to do with this guy. Yeah. So he left the room and went out and put his door, his ear to the door. <laughs> oh, man. He said, man. What the, you well, just like an endearing just, mental image, uh, has to be said, man. But so the boys came in and I just told them what was going on and I felt really bad and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to take a year off for everybody to get their shit together. And I think that it was a time when James had just, I mean, he missed his first son's first birthday. Oh, yeah. You know, it was that kind of thing. I mean, all just film, different yeah. things, just different things that people are getting divorces for the first time, having their first babies. We'd been on the locomotive going full bore, like the freaking furnace stoked all the way for 15 years. Yeah. Like this, not like this, or like this, yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah, totally. And nothing coming before the band. Everything, like last minute stuff, things you'd be planned for your, with your family for months to go do something. Last minute, to say on, on the day. Yeah. Right? Oh, you gotta go do this thing, this video for this thing, VH1, blah, blah, whatever the yeah, yeah, yeah. Ends up, you go there, you wait around for six hours, you go and play for five minutes, they put two minutes of it on the TV, and then go back home, but you miss the whole family thing just for that two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of stuff, once again, not complaining, yeah, yeah, just yeah. That's, stating that's just that the life facts, was. Mm. right? That's just how it was. And went full, 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 full bore, all the tours that everybody knows about, all the landmark things that happened, James, and for better or for worse, James being burned, broken arms, all kind of, you know, neck and shoulder injuries, alcoholism, drug addiction, all the things that go along with the program. Yeah, yeah. All that stuff is taking place and currently ongoing whatever at that moment, January 10th of 2001. As I look back once again through my super yeah. hindsight yeah, yeah, vision, yeah, of course. if anyone and the powers that be that we had taken part in earning millions of dollars, we earned millions of dollars for yeah, each other yeah. because they set us up for the opportunities we wouldn't kick their ass. <laughs> but we still earned millions for each other. Yeah, yeah, and they were still taking millions from our hard work and our sweat. Those people should have come in and like, what are you doing in there, mate? Like, I, I, you, I, light in, in the there? eyes. Yeah, are yeah. you okay in there? Yeah. How is your health? How is your family? Mm. How is your drug addiction? How is your neck? Yeah. How's your, you know, are you okay? Yeah. Maybe we should take some months off, get the monster back in order, and go and kick some ass again. Right? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. nobody did that. that takes, nobody yeah. checked the mental status of the guys that were earning all those squillions and making the yeah. world go round. Nobody did that. They just said, let's go, let's that keep going, let's, go, let's, go, let's, go, let's keep going, let's keep going. And ignorance. Yeah, right. You know, like yeah. straight ignorance. Like they only care about that. Yeah, man. I mean, I was, I was broken down in a freaking like puddle on the floor in an hour into this meeting you know just just destroyed they come in after we'd been talking for an hour the managers walk in the hell's going and they can see me just dead and Lars have been crying we, you know everybody's like you know and uh, they go so well I guess you didn't talk him out of it huh okay so well cool. um, so here we go and he pulls out this pile of papers and starts throwing the papers just like any other meeting any other, that's like any other day any other day any other meeting any other time any other year Wichita Kansas or London or whatever <laughs> right passes out the papers okay so uh, MTV on the 8th uh, 3 o'clock and then and then the uh, show and then we got the uh, the Grammys and the uh, let's say so let's go to page 2 and um, you know and everybody's looking at and Lars looks at him and goes, do you hear? Yeah. Did you hear what he just said? Yeah, yeah. Right? And, uh, yeah, that's fine. Just peeling through it like it was nothing. Whoa. Like, just, like, just nothing. Like, expendable, you know? And I, so I go, gee, who's making the right decision right now? Yeah, man. This guy, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy, fair. right here. Totally fair. You know what I'm saying? So what did, it was... I mean, I, it was, my neck was... Up. I needed some time. Yeah. Everybody was screwed up. I needed to go get to a doctor. I needed physical help. I was addicted to painkillers already at that point. Oh, wow. Before I even got going on surgeries, I was already addicted. I needed some help. Yeah. Right? Everybody needed some help. James was so drunk, man. We were there at whatever time in the morning. Dude was already hitting beers that tall. Them big ones. Yeah, I've seen your yeah. forearm-sized yeah, hands yeah. you do in the States. 
And so that, you know, we none of us were in a good state of any of the things. And there's so many secrets and stuff that everybody had, too, that should have really been probably dealt yeah. with. Not in, not in public like no, we were, no. which was real f I think. Yeah. But it shouldn't have been put on the screen for people to see the secrets that were seen. Um, but there were many more than that that uh, should have been dealt with in a private way, considering all the money that was being earned and everything that was being generated for the thousands of people around the world by the four guys. Yeah. So that's what should have happened, shoulda, woulda, coulda. Yeah, know, yeah of course, yeah. All anymore. Yeah, hindsight's but that's 20, 20. Right, that's exactly what happened, though, is that they didn't, you know, the respect was just all over the place, and then said, one week from now, let's get back together in this same room, and we'll talk, see if anything can be resolved, or if, if we're going to make this happen or not. Came back one week later, I had my press announcements ready. I said, this is it. Maybe you're really doing it. And then nobody called me during the week. Nobody said, hey, dude, you sure about this? You want to talk about it? They want to get together for dinner. Wow. Let's talk about it or whatever like that. Just Wow. After all that so, time. So I have to ask, uh, where were you when you first saw some kind of monster and what did you think? My wife and I, my now wife, yeah. then, then girlfriend, were um, in Montana at the ranch. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, going 70 miles per hour in the driveway because it's two miles long. Yep. <laughs> Off a <of> guy. <laughs> My vibe. Came back and we heard that the movie came out. We went to our local refurbished old school theater, right? And they were showing it because it's their local heroes, right? So they were showing it at the little tucked away place there in the Bay Area. It was me and my girl and three kids about four rows back. And I'm sit, I sat right in the very middle, <laughs> like, as if it was a private showing. Private showing, man. Got my smoke on, went in there, yeah. you know, just watching us. I'm going, really? You guys? Holy shit. And I started, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And I kept going on like that. And because I had to, I can't imagine point, having lived It was a couple yeah. years out. I was out for a couple years already yeah, when yeah. I saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd been able to distance myself from any kind of get the outsider view on it a little bit, uh, like the fan yeah, thing. Yeah, totally. Um, not good. You know, that was just that was, was like unsavory bits that should be kept in private. Mm. I felt that they were exposing too much. In the beginning, when I saw it and talked to people in interviews about it, there are some humans, as you dig into them psychologically or whatever like that, if you send there, want to do that thing, if you want to dig into them, and you want to do that analysis or something. There are some persons that cans, their cans are not meant to be opened. The black worms that exist inside are not meant to be exposed to the light. They need to stay there. Yeah. They can be dealt with and talk to other people. They're not meant to be exposed to the public. And when you have someone as deep as that field and that kind of thing, you don't open that can. I think it's a very dangerous thing because of what we talked about early in the interview, a person's capacity to handle certain things like this that they just don't have. A little those bit like tools. an under the microscope. Yeah, yeah, you mm. just, yes. You don't, you, know, you just don't have those tools. And so I think that's part of the situation is they opened up a guy that shouldn't have been opened up that much. Mm. And they kind of this thing came out and he was searching and trying to figure out how to make sense of it, why not just share it with everybody so I'm not hiding anything somehow. And then within Joe Berlinger and the other guys, he trusted those movie makers. Mm. And so, you know, I think they, I'm not sure what they say now about it 10 years later, I'd be interested to see what they say about yeah, yeah. it now that all that time has gone by, and maybe they can look at it a little objectively as well. But so getting back to the theater by, my, by ourselves, yeah. watching that thing, and when my part came on, I was very proud. The edits that they made were very true. I said what I said, it was all real, and I felt that I came out of it shining. Yeah. And because I was as always as honest as I possibly <laughs> yeah, it's, can be. It's like a razor blade in that you film. Know? And that, so I that just, moment. I feel really, I still to this day feel good about the, uh, the way I conducted myself on any part of this whole thing. Right. So now to, to bring the Metallica stuff full circle, uh, doing the 30th anniversary shows. Now, as someone from the other side of the road, uh, other side of the world, who like I couldn't afford flights at the time, Met Club member, like I remember looking and, and seeing like, oh, you know, it's it's cool that Halford's there. It's cool that King Diamond's out and rocking again. And it was it, it was even cool that Mustaine was there. But it was like the you had got up there and having come out of that whole some kind of monster thing and there being a bit more of a of a long running story it felt like a very warm and great as a metallica fan it felt like a really great thing that there was kind of a rubber stamp and everyone was cool again mm -hmm. 
I can only was that was it like that on the stage? And what was the rush before walking out and like going again? Yeah, the 30th anniversary thing was really a an incredible magical time. The week, the whole week, um, and there was no way I could have predicted its influence or the outcome. Um, that the difference it's made in my life, I there's no way I could have predicted it. I didn't. I knew people would be happy to see me, and I knew I certainly was going to be happy to see them. Um, I had no idea about the welcoming. I had no idea how warm and joyous and just holy cut it with a chainsaw. You know, the people were so happy and so receptive. And there's, you know, 20 or 30 languages represented on the floor there. Uh -huh. the oh, God, yeah, yeah. So the world is really represented. <clears throat> and I walked in. I was trying to be really, really humble. I came in head down, back entrance, just really cool with my girl and my friend. Keeping it cool. It's an old theater where there's a balcony up top, you know, and proper. And this side of the balcony was the VIP section. And so they walked me up there. And I'm trying to stay away. There's like 10, probably 10 or 12 layers deep of people, you know, all the way up to the box seats. And then the crowd's down here and there's the wall. And so I walk in. I'm about four or five people and I'm just kind of making my way. And I see Ray Burton and um, and um, uh, Lars's dad, Torben, right, are sitting yeah. together on one of the box seats, look, looking out <laughs> over the thing like the old guys in the Muppets, man. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the old. And it's all the kids there on the floor, and Jimmy Brewer's on the stage making jokes. You know, so they're all are facing this way. And Ray motions me over, and I go over to hug him. You know, and we hug like that, and then I catch the kid's eye down on the floor like this. He sees me hugging Ray, and he. Yes. Like that, yeah, right? totally. And the whole floor <laughs> turns this way, towards the side, not facing the stage anymore. Yeah, like man. Every no surprise. Like all. that. Yeah, like yeah, they yeah. were instructed to do it. Like <laughs> that. And I look down and they're, rise on, rise on. Like do what? Yeah. You know, and I kind of back up a little bit because I didn't want to, you yeah. know, somebody's on yeah, stage, Jim, you're not supposed to thing. distract things, you know, like that. When you go up to watch another band, you're not supposed to be out there so everybody yeah, can see yeah, of you. Yeah, course. Stay back here. Absolutely. So I'm trying to play that. I'm trying to be humble, man. I'm trying to play back. And Ray goes. <laughs> and he pulls me back. And, yeah. goes, and he goes, give him some. And so I wave. And they're great. Like that. I'm like, Shh. I hadn't even played yet or nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just standing there. I'm like, holy. And I was just excited uh, to get on like any other time. I treated it like it was a Metallica show, even though I was only going for three or four sh songs. I kind of took over one of the backstage rooms there where the people were, where the girls, the wardrobe girls were, yeah. you know, everybody, I knew my whole family there, I mean, she, yeah, yeah. so they're doing, where well, they're doing their thing, I kind of moved their stuff aside, I put my stuff in there, did my stretches, set up my thing, did my vocal warm up, just like I was at a Metallica show, just like I fell right into it, I mean, it was exactly like a week had passed, we had a week off to go home, and since we were in San Francisco, I just drove over to the gig, and I got there, and there I was, doing my stretch again, ready for the show, ready for the show, waiting for, yeah, oh, Halford's on, oh, Deacon, that's nice, that's nice, not good, I'm not even going to watch it, that's nice, that's nice, because yeah. it doesn't matter, because I'm playing. <laughs> Don't matter who's playing before me, because I'm playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And that whole thing, and just getting psyched up, psyched up, psyched up, listening to my song, got a couple songs I always listen to before I go on, get that stuff going, get ready for the thing, go up there and kick ass, went on stage, and holy crap. Kids went nuts, and um, you know I talked to Lars, and he said, "What songs you want to play? Fastest ones. You got to play <laughs> two fastest songs off of every record. That's 14. That's what I'm doing. Ready, go. <laughs> so that's you know every damage, fight fire, yep. battery, yep. everything. That's a, that's it. So well, somebody's already doing motor breath. Well, well, that's, that's like whiplash then. That's fine, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we did, and each night got better. By the third night was the true epiphany. I mean, I just really got floored by the people. And dude, this is what you're supposed to be doing? What the f are you thinking? Yeah. This is obviously what you're supposed to be doing. So here we are, a year and a half later, after that show, world tour, LP coming out. Da -da -da. This is like one of the most exciting bits of the whole thing. Coming back, like the EP was exactly what I'd hoped for from a, from a Newstead record. Nice. It's all the power of the riff. The whole thing is all exactly. riffed out. Yep. Is that what we're going to expect from a full-length Newstead record? I think that the EP is a good uh, indicator, as when the EP was invented. the underdogs, inve man. <laughs> Whenever the EP was invented back in the day to be the primer or sampler of the LP to come, yeah. I think that's a fair a fair assessment of what's going on now. So Soldier Head and King of the Underdogs will reappear on the LP. Oh, right, it's cool. It's a God's Sake and Skyscraper will all 
be the instant classics that yeah. exist on the EP only. Um, I think that EP is representative of what's going to happen and live. You know, we're playing a lot of new songs and it's been a, the response from people have been very good. We're asking a lot of a lot from the crowd to be responding to songs that they've never heard before. Yeah, a couple of songs, Soldier Header, where they maybe heard a couple times, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's all brand new music. So, considering that, I think we're doing really, really good. Um, <clears throat> it's it's a lot of new challenges for me. You know, singing, being the front man, my name's on it, it's my songs, my voice, my words, I mean... It's Were you tempted to give it a band name? Yes. Um, you know, I never really intended to do this. I really, 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 really didn't plan on coming back out into the world with music or anything like that. Never did. Because never, never you did. disappeared off the radar. Like much, post post Voivod, like, it, you kind of, it was like... Jason yes, yep. I should, uh, all the things that I did, you know, I never stopped playing music. I've recorded and played more music out of Metallica than I played in Metallica. But forgive my ignorance. What did you? What? What? What were the things within that post Voivod okay, so time? Okay, so as soon as well, Echo Brain obviously yeah, is that from yep. the top, and then I joined Voivod Oz, right after that. Ozzy so for us all. Voivod. September of 2002, yeah. started Voivod just as I was finishing Echo Brain. So I ended up making three albums with Voivod yep. from 2003 to 2008. Um, so that was in the pieces, and then I did yeah. a bunch of um, like, like you know, recording with Government Mule, recording with oh, Tour, recording with DJ Shadow, recording with uh, <laughs> Tina Turner. Holy, really? yeah, I mean, that must have been mind blowing. Yeah, so all a lot, you know, a lot of got called out by a lot of different people. <laughs> some yeah. I said yes to, some I said no to. Right, fair. You know, but I still get offers all the time for different cool things. Yeah, um, but that existed the whole time. So whether it was above uh, the board, like. International release and the limelight, or mm. anything. That was a couple. Like I know the Tina Turner single thing went. It was number one in in, mm. in, in Europe and a few different places. Mm. Played on this single with the Italian vocalist named Elise, and I know that was number one in Italy. Mm. Um, so you know, the, just yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. different flavors of music through time. Yeah, and forget kept about that all that going. Yeah, so I really kept that um, from December '04 to the middle of '08. I had three different surgeries on my shoulders, so I had one here, one here, and then back to here again. Yeah. <clears throat> it pretty much debilitated me from being the monster for four years. Back to full banging now? Yeah, so I'm, I'm 95% is all I could ever be now yeah. because of the damage it's done. It's flesh and bone, and it's just what it is, my vertebrae <laughs> from this thing. We've you seen know, how hard like, you've gone over the years. Watch some videos, yeah, yeah, yeah. no mysteries. Yeah. You know, it's like... It's I always remember the serious. fact that your Justice for All action figure was mid-headbang, right, which right. kind of sums, just, sums up what we're saying. It's just kind of perpetual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that... Those years were taken away from me as far as trying to really play anything serious. I could do some studio stuff, a lot of that studio stuff I just mentioned, I did yeah. in, those, in those times. So it was time, a lot of time where I had this, you know, I had a, my arm was fixed like this. Oops. My arm was fixed like this, mm -hmm. and I could fit a Parker Fly guitar, which is two pounds, you know, it's about that wide. And I could finish, fit it in between my stomach and my sling here, I play like that. Wow. You know, so I did that as much as I could. Yeah. But as far as like any kind of full thing, yeah, you know, that's, so I started painting instead, and then... Uh, learned to use both hands the same because I had to. So I was yeah. without that one, then without that one, then without that again. So now I use both the same, which is better for my playing and all the paintings are done with both hands. And right. So it's just kind of uh, everything for a reason. Give me some lemons, get that wicked lemonade. And so the so the epiphany came at the at the 30th anniversary yeah. thing. Yep. Did, 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 was it was it partly that like the reaction of people there made you go, people people still want metal from me pretty much entirely yeah reaction. cool the people you know, the cat the catalyst was the energy from the people being so happy after all the years like they'd saved it up for a decade to show me and uh you know about two weeks before lars had called saying they were going to do this thing mm. i'd been out with papa wheelie you know yeah. doing my thing and we opened for anvil and caius and sword and did all these cool stony metal shows and stuff around the bay area and i was loving it yeah because nobody really knew who we were and I could slab it out. We know where the song starts, but where it ends, nobody knows. You know, it's like yeah, it's just, totally. Just, <laughs> just loud as crap. So I was feeling it again. I got bit a little bit. And Lars called. I'm like, mm. right. And then I just needed that extra little push. And so when I finally, the people gave me that was, I would say, 98% of it was the people screaming me back into it. And that's why I'm doing it now. I will have you know. That on these shows, these 60 or 70 that we're in the middle of right now, as mm -hmm. we play around Europe and do the Sonospheres and downloads and all that, and then yeah. we go on Gigantour with Megadeth. You know, there is no profit in this for me. There is zero profit, or actually less than zero profit, right. on any of these 70 shows. I'm doing it because I want to do it. I was in a band once, I was a part of a band, 
that did pretty well. Yeah, they were all right. And I and I didn't <laughs> and I didn't put those earnings up my nose. You know, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I drank yeah. some of them. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't put them on my face. Yeah. And I invested and I did all that thing. So by the Black Album doing so well, backing us working so hard, then makes this possible for my band to come and play for the people. I'm bringing the metal to the people because I feel like it. Right now, there's no money in it for me. I'm just doing it because I want to do it. I want to just show them. You know, there's a lot of cool things that happen with reunions. I'm proud of some of the people that come back and do them. But many of them end up being what, I don't know, it could tarnish the legend that you already had created or something like that, and that's a dangerous thing. Okay. Fans expect to see a certain thing from the band that they loved at a certain time. When they come back and they don't see what they expect or it doesn't exist anymore, Ooh. then it's kind of a disappointment. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Or if they come and they see five times the band yeah, that they yeah. saw before yeah, or something yeah. like that, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That goes the same way. It's a disappointing thing, you know? So I'm the same fighting weight I was on the Black Album. Uh -huh. You know, it's the same. I am the same kid. The calendar went by, but I am the same person. Like we started talking about at the very beginning of this. I'm the metal kid that Motorhead's still my favorite. And that thing, you know what I'm saying? I'm still that guy. I just happened to get lucky in that way, and I wasn't forced to grow up. I can make grown-up decisions for lots of money, <laughs> yeah. but I don't have to grow up because I can still be loud, my work is play, and all that kind of thing. And I want to keep that mentality going for as long as I can. You know, 2013, a great time to be Jason Newstead. It is. It really is. Thank yep. you so much Happy for your to time be alive, today, man. man. Thank you. Scott, it's Jason Newstead. <laughs>